So now it's uh, time for our last uh, talk today. Uh, and that's uh, Chris Thorison is, is back here to uh, talk about the intelligent household uh, robots and how they can perceive our environment. Uh, this is uh, a part of work at uh, IIIM, uh, but uh, as other work that we have seen today has had its origins uh, back at Cadia in the day. So uh, it's interesting to see how these, all of these things have moved forward. And I'll give uh, the word to, to Chris. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> So, the future, if you're old enough to remember these, is full of household robots. Um, I am old enough to remember watching the Jetsons on TV, but I'm not old enough to have seen the premiere of Forbidden Planet in 54. Um, and as you know, the journey has already started. So um, a question that we have been asking ourselves is uh, how do you give robots a decent understanding of office or home environments to, uh, to safely move around, but perhaps without uh, the thorough and constant maintenance of pro human programmers? So... Um, we're essentially saying, or asking ourselves, okay, given this kind of environment, now what can we do to provide robots with an understanding of, of these things? And of course, um, if you've looked at architectural blueprints, uh, you can, you know, blueprints are around. You could possibly just give the robots the blueprints for the house that they're going to be uh, um, working at. Um, and just to ground this a little bit, uh, we already have examples in the, in the US, for example, of robots running, roaming around in hospitals uh, with, with trays of medicine and other things. Uh, well, they're probably not trays with medicine just sitting on top. Uh, probably a locked box in the center of the robot um, to which you need a, a key code to get at. But, but in any case, um, the same... Um, uh, the same question will have to be answered, you know, if we don't want to run, have to run wires in the walls of, of every hospital uh, there is, um, we're going to have to come up with some better methods. And ideally, we, we would like to, you know, for a new hospital, let's say, or for your office environment, we'd like to just call up a number, say, hey, I need to order some robots. And, you know, after a quick initial uh, 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 look, and uh, run around in the, in the environment, they should get a pretty good, decent picture of what, what, uh, uh, what this invo uh, involves. Of course, in, in houses and uh, various buildings, you have not just walls, you also have furniture, and we need to think about these things. Um, you also have people, and I'll come to that in a second. What we'd like to do is create a mechanism for the robots to fuse uh, their knowledge uh, from various modes, not just color or shape or speech, but you know, a number of them. And speaking of speech, of course, in human environments, you know, we essentially uh, convey information to each other via speech. And so, uh, relating to to Yon's talk uh, just before mine, um, we we want machines to to better understand speech and and what this involves. In my thesis. I gave this example of, uh, of a future robot. This was way before Roomba. And uh, this robot is a multimodal robot, so you, uh, multimodal vacuum cleaner. So you can actually give it instructions. Um, it also has attention. As you notice, you can get its attention by saying its name. It looks at you, and then you can tell it where to clean better, and so on. Um, this was based on my thesis work, which uh, essentially created a multimodal model of a, of a virtual robot that you could talk to about the solar system. And we have more recent examples of, of uh, experiments and, and work in this direction. Um, the Honda Asimo robot, for example, I was involved with giving it some skills for playing card games with, with kids. So yes, the journey has started, but 
we have a long way to go. One um, very practical and, and uh, useful example of how to employ the work that uh, this involves is intelligent wheelchairs. Now, uh, people who are uh, in some way disabled in, and, and uh, less mobile than us more fortunate um, would, for example, benefit greatly from having an intelligent chair uh, like this DFKI um, Bremen uh, robotic wheelchair that the user can actually, and I tried this, you, you, can talk, you can call this wheelchair if you're in a room, you know, you can call the wheelchair, it comes driving to you and um, you can sit in it and then tell it to go to the bathroom or to the kitchen, etc. So yes, um, that's the kind of context that we're thinking about. Now, the knowledge representation that we started with uh, a while back, actually, it's been several years now, uh, at least six years, um, is the uh, concept of an oak tree. And we structure this in a way that space is represented as successfully smaller uh, cubes. Uh, and each cube is divided into eight cubes and, and so on, down several levels. Now, of course, the number of levels uh, depends on your, the granularity that you want the robot to understand space at. For example, if you want, if, if all it needs to understand is uh, about a centimeter big, then the smallest cube would be uh, a cubic centimeter. And so up to, say, buildings. Or if you have a robot that, wants, that goes between buildings, you may, we may want bigger cubes, uh, or more levels. Um, so inside of, the, of these cubes, you have uh, nodes representing various data. We have, we're fusing together um, information about color, uh, about a spatial structure of things. So if, for example, the robot has, um, as in, in our system, a depth sensor, and also the, the DFKI wheelchair has depth sensors. So it, it, as it drives around, it can actually map the environment and match it to its knowledge of that same space and see if anything has changed. So we have uh, depth space uh, extrusions, like a chair that wasn't there before will now be seen as, uh, the, uh, as roughly a cubic meter being occupied by some new object. As you, as you get closer, it may be resolved into uh, more detail. But um, uh, what's new here, uh, among other things, is that we also are inserting semantic information into the oct tree itself. So if you walk around with the robot and you say, you know, here's the kitchen, here's Dion's office, um, the spatial knowledge of the robot and the, its experience of the speech uh, and these uh, semantic terms that are being used in the speech are actually encoded spatially and temporally. And um, we give the robot as well an, an ontology. So um, actually, an office environment can be pretty easily encoded in an ontology with, uh, where, you have, where nodes represent concepts and then the relationship between these concepts is represented by links. Uh, the links can themselves be actually nodes, uh, depending on how advanced you want the ontology to be. So um, with this knowledge, for example, we have uh, created a, a nice way of inferring whether something is a wall. And so even without the, the, uh, the blueprint, the robot can simply drive around and experience the environment. It knows when uh, something is occupied by its uh, distance sensors. You know, you could imagine, for example, putting a Kinect on it, with, which would also give you for free some knowledge about human, uh, uh, humans in the environment. And um, it uses the ontology to essentially um, infer different things about the, the, the spatial semantic knowledge that it's acquiring. So if you're walking through a kitchen and you say, you know, this is the kitchen, and it catches glimpses of some walls, it can, uh, in fact, fill this, 
the, the oct tree with semantic information that this space is in fact part of what we call a kitchen. So essentially, if you ask it later to go to the kitchen, it can infer that any place inside of the room that we call a kitchen is sufficient to you know, fulfill the goal of being in the kitchen. Uh, we do this so easily that it's just ludicrous how, how the lengths that we have to go to to actually tell robots how to do this. So here's an example of a, of a more uh, detailed ontology. It, it may take a week or it may take a month to create something uh, of this granularity that's really good. Uh, it's not a huge amount of work. Uh, but combine this with the octree, you, you have a very new, interesting, powerful way of giving the robot a knowledge about its environment. So we have a, in a, in a simulated office space, you, the, the green dots there uh, represent a trail that you can put down. For example, if you're walking with the robot through the space, um, we're using this to test our algorithm. So, you know, any one of these green cubes can be assigned uh, an utterance, say, here is the kitchen or here is Dion's office. And as the robot moves around, it fills its oct tree with knowledge. If it hears a speech, for example, here's Dion's office, it fills it with semantic labels, or essentially meaning. Um, if it sees simply occupied versus free, uh, it marks the, the uh, oct tree nodes this way. So here's the, here's the robot driving around. It, it it's, sort of looks like a volcano. Uh, it's, we never got further around to actually give it a, a head and um, some, some more interesting features, but it works for now. Um, and the, the cones there that you see is essentially a simulation of its uh, um, depth sensors. So as it, as it drives around, it fills essentially its surrounding space with occupied versus non-occupied. This, this picture essentially, if it's not occupied, it's not marked at all. Uh, the green ones uh, are an approximation of occupation um, of the space. And so as the robot essentially gets more experience with a particular space, its knowledge in the arc tree gets filled up. And as I mentioned already, the, uh, we have spatial semantic operators that um, spread semantics over space based on its interactions with humans and uh, you know, uh, uh, utterances and so on. So um, this together, the arc tree and the ontology uh, and the wall and furniture detectors, we, already, we don't have any we only have the wall detector right now, but um, it's enough to, to get us started on experimenting with sort of what does the robot do when it gets uh, semantic knowledge um, and how does it relate it to its, the space itself. You could even imagine uh, a robot hearing the words, you know, here is Dion's office, trying to look around to see a, a door opening or asking a question, are we in Dion's office? just to resolve the spatial reference of whether uh, the office is actually the space surrounding the robot, in which case it could uh, essentially know already where his office is versus knowing that something is a doorway. That's another sensor that we would be developing in the near future so that you could say, you know, well, wherever the human was looking when he said, that's Dion's office, uh, there should be a door there or a, or a door opening. And and I will mark that semantically as Dion's office, or the, the door into Dion's office using the ontology. Um, so essentially, this is a very nice new representation for spatial semantic knowledge. It turns out that when we started this, uh, the work on wheelchairs had really not gotten very far. And the DFKI guys, for example, are still behind us in, in the, uh, in the uh, knowledge representation for the, for the wheelchair. So uh, that's it for now. Thank you. And for a couple of questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh,
this uh, an overlap with this and uh, simultaneous localization and mapping Islam is, would, would be extremely exciting. Is, is, is there anything like that? This is, this is Islam. This is simultaneous localization and mapping. It's done differently than most uh, others are doing it, uh, especially in that we are uh, doing, we we're using these uh, spatial semantic operators to combine uh, spatial semantic knowledge into the same knowledge structure. Um, well, I could also imagine that uh, those guys could need, or you know, I can imagine that they would be using or, or would need uh, an efficient representation of the information that they gather with their like filling yeah. up uh, hard drives. Uh, um, yeah. <coughs> Efficiency is one issue, but um, our concern is more in, in breadth of different types of knowledge and using these in a unified way so that the robot can actually make use of knowledge uh, acquired of one kind of knowledge to improve knowledge of another kind. And, and an example of that is you know, looking for a doorway because offices have doors, and this is what the ontology tells the robot. Offices have doors. Every office has a door. It's a simple fact. It's not hard to code, you know, by hand. We envision, we envision this system always on, always trying to improve its knowledge and possibly making the robot curious because, you know, it, it might come around next time. Oh, this is where, uh, you know, Yon said that Dion's office is. Let, and I, but I couldn't find a door at the po that point. Let me drive around a little bit and see if I can find one. And so it's actually the seed for uh, having the robot act more intelligently and possibly more autonomously in this respect. Yes, uh, that, so that concludes our day. Uh, thank you, and thanks, uh, Chris, again.